Amen. All right. So um, in Genesis chapter 12, there's something I wanted to get to last week um, if I had enough time, but I didn't. But it's, it's fine because it's an overlap here between chapter 11 and chapter 12. Um, obviously, you know, it's been an entire week since we just looked at chapter 11. A whole week's gone by, and we're, doing, we're going through the Bible chapter at a time. It's real convenient. It's nice. But the Bible didn't always have chapter divisions when it was written down. Um, there's been paragraphs in the way it's written, but it's, it, it, you know, the divisions by chapter, number, and verse is something that actually came a little bit later. It's not the way that it was originally written down. You know, when, when Moses is writing down the, the first five books of the Bible, he's not going verse 1, verse 2, you know, in this chapter. That's not the way that he did it. So um, just re re keep that in memory because there seems to be, there are some pretty natural divisions between these chapters. You, could, you know, there's, there's kind of a break and a change in, in thought and, and what they're talking about, but um, it's still continuous. So we're going to look at a, a few verses from chapter 11 and from the first verse in chapter 12. So in, in chapter 12, verse number one, we see the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Now this is an important statement. This is referred to multiple times later on in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. God is calling Abraham out from his home, out from his family, out from the land that he lives in, and saying, I want you to go unto a land where I'm going to show you that land. Right? And this is one of the reasons why Abraham is, is like you know, one of the father figures of faith. He's, he's, he's very uh, much credited with having great faith in God. And think about how much faith that takes to just say, okay, I want you to pick up and move, get away from your family, get away from everything you know, and I'm, I'm not even telling you where you're going. You just have to start going, and, and I'll tell you when you get there. Is, that's the kind of thing that he's, that he's doing to him. He's saying, unto a land that I will show thee. And um, that requires a lot of faith, especially, you know, today we have a lot of conveniences, with our technology and things, you know, just hop in the car, you can make long travels and long, you know, long trips and stuff. It's not that big of a deal, but you're making a journey. You don't know where you're going. You don't know how much food you need to bring. You don't know how to prepare for this. And if you're walking or even going on, on an animal, you know, the animals need to rest. You have to take breaks. You're going to be out in, you know, in the wilderness. You're going to be out in, in different areas, you know, making this, this travel. Who knows where you're going? It requires a lot of faith to do something like that. That's not, that's not the easiest thing in the world. And the more we read about this, the easier it becomes for us to just think, oh yeah, Abraham did it. You know, like, like of course he listened to God. Like, like it's just a foregone conclusion. Like, like, yeah, of course I would just do it. If God said it, I would just do it. Right? How many people of us have that type of an attitude? I know I have. I read the Bible. I'm just like, well, yeah, of course God said to do it. He's going to do it. But again, think about the reality of, of the situation. And ask yourself, would you really do it? You know, God is, is asking you to do a lot of things today. Do you even do those things? You know, the Bible tells us a lot of things that we're supposed to be doing. Do you do them? And those are, those are very clearly um, um, delineated, delineated in the Bible what we ought to be doing. But think about this. That, that's a, it's pretty neat that Abraham did what he did. But we're going to see something else here that he actually didn't do it right away. When you read it, and it's easy to read over this. But in, um, in verse number one, you know, God, and he speaks unto Abraham. Look, it's, it's, he's not speaking to his whole family. He's saying, he's, he, the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, so away from your family, and, um, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. He's calling him out of all of those places. Verse number two says, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. A, a very serious blessing of a, a promise of a blessing to Abraham is given to him here. He's saying, look, I'm going to make an entire nation from you. Meaning he's, he's going to have a lot of children. He's going to have, you know, a land in, in this whole area that he's going to give to Abraham. But um, look, if you would, back, we're going to jump back to chapter 11. Look at verse number 31. Because God called and notice, just real quick, in verse number one, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram. That's past tense. Like, it already had happened. The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. Look at verse, or chapter 11, verse 31. The Bible says, And Terah, that's Abram's dad, took Abram his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, 
his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees. Remember, Ur of the Chaldees is where Abraham's nativity was. That's where his land was. That's where he was living to go into the land of Canaan. So we see here, Terah, Lot, you know, all this, this whole group, his family, his father, um, is going with Abram into the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan is the land where um, the promised land, right? That's, that's the, the place where um, God has promised to give unto Abram. So, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. So they didn't make it very far. Elizabeth set up. They didn't make it very far. They made it to, to Haran, which really is still in that Mesopotamian region before um, getting into the land of Canaan. And what's interesting here, and you could turn, flip over to Acts chapter 7. We're going to see this a little bit more as well. Um, we see here in Genesis chapter 11, 31 that we just read that Abram didn't get, him, get out of from his father's house. He didn't leave his kindred his, in his father's house. They all went with him. Now, what happened as a result is that they all got stuck then in Haran. And Haran is the land of, uh, if you remember, Tira's, one of his other children's name was Haran, and Haran died before his father did. And that's the land of, of his son, basically, it was Haran. So it's not very far from, from where Abram was originally. Um, they go into Haran, and that's where they die. And look, at, and look at Acts chapter 7, verse number 2. The Bible says, And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. This is important because it gives us a timeline of events. In Genesis 12, 1, the Bible said, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, but it doesn't say exactly when he said it. But we see from Acts 7, 2, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Karen. Now, Karen is just a Greek for Haran, same place. So before he even gets to Haran, that is when God spoke unto him. In verse 3 of Acts 7, he says, And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. The exact same phrase that we read essentially from Genesis chapter 12. Verse number 4, Acts 7. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charan. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. God called him out before they even made it to Haran. God called him out and said, look, you need to leave your father's house, leave your kindred, go unto the land that I'm going to show you. So obviously Abraham must have told his family, it's okay, I'm leaving. And his dad's like, wait, I'm coming with you. And Lot's coming with. And so they all start making this trek. And then what happens? They get stuck in Haran. And they get stuck in Haran all the way until Abram's father dies. He's there, he, he keeps them back that whole time. And then he finally lists, you know, hearkens unto God's commandment and, and what God told him to do and goes all the way into the land of Canaan. And he got stuck along the way. Now, Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 10. Because we need to be able to obey God's call and not let anyone hold us back. What we see here is Abram's father. Obviously, he must have loved his father, you know, and listened to him. And, um, you know, I'm sure he was a good son. But when God tells you, hey, I want you to leave your father, leave your mother, leave your brethren, and I, you need to come out into a land that I showed you, we need to just do that. And we can't let anybody hold us back from serving God and doing what's right. When God tells us to do something, God gets the priority. Even your own father, right? As in Abram's case. His own father, if his own father would tell him, no, you can't go. If God tells you to go and do something, you do it. And you do it the way that God told you to do it. Because obviously God already knew he had to get away from his father's house because his father was going to hold him back which is exactly what happened. And we can't compromise and say, well, I'm going to do what God told me to do, but not exactly the way he told me to do it. I'm going to do it my own way. You know, my dad wants to come with. I don't see the harm in my dad coming with. So we're all, we're all going to go into this land. No, Abram, that's not what God told you to do. 
he told you to leave your, your, your father's house, to leave those people and just to go and do this because God had a special plan for you. And his special plan didn't include the rest of Abram's family. I'm sure he had other plans for the rest of Abram's family to do something else. And it wasn't part of Abram's plan. Now, if you're in Matthew 10, look at verse number 34. Because we need to make sure no one holds us back from our calling, from our duty unto God. Act, uh, Matthew 10, verse 34 says, Think not, this is Jesus Christ speaking, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes, that means your enemies, shall be they of his own household. You're saying when Jesus Christ comes, Jesus Christ commands, Jesus Christ, hush your mouth. Jesus Christ commands, when you start obeying the Bible and what God has for you to do, it's going to cause division. It's going to cause division in the household. It's going to cause, you know, Jesus Christ is, is explaining this. It's going to set the mother against the daughter, mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law. By obeying God and listening to his voice, this is what's going to happen. He says, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is Jesus Christ speaking. This is the importance that he ought to have in your life. Now, I love my wife. I love my children. I love my parents. But none of them are loved more than my love for Jesus Christ. And that's not to, to lessen how much I love my family. But this is what's demanded of. He says, you know, if you love your father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. And apparently Abraham loved his father more than, than he cared about what God specifically told him to do. Because he was held back from doing what he was told to do all the way up until his dad died. I mean, it took his dad dying before he actually followed through with what he was told to do. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Verse 59. Luke 9, 59 says, And he said unto another, Follow me. And again, this is Jesus Christ speaking. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Doesn't seem like that unreasonable of a request, right? Your dad dies, I need to go. But see, I don't think that his, uh, his dad just died. I think he's saying, let me wait until my dad dies and, and bury my father, and then I'll come and follow you. That's wh when he says that, let me first go and bury my father. I don't think it's like, his dad just died, but he happened to be listening to Jesus and he just needs to go bury him real quick and then, and then head out. I think he meant his dad's old. He's going to be dying soon. Let me just wait until my dad dies and let me bury him and then I'll come and follow you. And look what it says here in verse number six, because that's exactly what, what Abraham did, isn't it? He waited until his father died and then he obeyed God. But look at verse number 60. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. <coughs> These are strong words that Jesus Christ uses um, about how we ought to be listening and, and doing and acting on what he has for us to do and the priority that we ought to put on God's commandments in our life. Flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We'll go back to Genesis 12. Verse number 4 says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, I was trying to figure out how, lo how much time he actually spent in Haran, and I, couldn't, I could not tell, I couldn't figure it out. But he was 75 when he left. And we know that his father had died there, and we know that, I mean, we could make guesses, but that's all they're going to be. I, I don't know, unless, um, you know, if someone else figures out, I'd, I'd be interested to hear. Um, biblically speaking, from Scripture, how long of time he spent there. I couldn't figure it out. Um, I tried to figure out when Haran died because we know Haran died before his father and then his father ended up dying. So that, that whole time that he spent in that land is kind of hard to, uh, I, I wasn't able to figure out. But regardless, he didn't do it right away. And it sounds like quite a bit of time went by. And he was 75 years old when he finally left. And remember, 
God made Abraham the promise that he was going to make a great nation out of him and everything else. I mean, 75 is a pretty old man. And even in these days, he said that's, that's, that was getting old. Um, now, they were still living a little bit older than, than we do today. But this is like when Abraham came around, this is like the end of that whole era of people living longer than like 100 years or whatever, right? Kind of like what we would think today is be really old. But, um, yeah, in verse 4 it says that he was 75 years old. But another thing I want to point out here is that, you, you know, we can't say what would have happened for sure, obviously. You can't do that about anything. This is what actually happened, and we know that for a truth. But I think what would have happened if Abraham would have listened to God right away? Because there were problems that come up later that Abraham gets himself into sin, and I wonder, would he have even gotten himself into that sin? Look, if you flip over to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16 is going to cover where, you know, there's a kind of a lapse in faith because Abraham goes into Canaan when he finally gets there, and he was there for 10 years before he then takes a second wife, essentially, with Hagar, where Sarai's wife gives him Hagar, and that's how Ishmael was born. Right? Where um, they start to think, well, Sarah's barren, so we need to do something about this. God promised me seed, but it's not coming from Sarah, so maybe we just need to do this instead. And again, not according to God's plan. They take the matter in their own hands. And we'll get into that a lot more when we, when we read Genesis 16. But look at verse number 3. It says, And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And then in verse 16, you could jump down there. The Bible says, And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So he was 86 years old at this time when he, when he finally had Ishmael, which was his firstborn son, not through Sarah, but through Hagar. And he was, you know, 74 or 75 years old, excuse me, when, when he left Haran to go and finally do what... what uh, God had commanded him to. So you think about however much time, let's say it was 10 years or 20 years or whatever, that he spent with his father before his father finally died and he actually did what God told him to do. In that time frame, would he have been, you know, like would God have blessed him earlier with Isaac, with his son, with the son that he already intended to do? Or did, or did God make him wait even longer as a result of him, not, you know, waiting to, to fulfill God's, what God told him to do? You know, God might have said, well, now I'm going to wait. And, and your blessing's not going to come now for a long time. And obviously, God's able to make everything work out if he want, you know, the way that he wants to. He's, he's able to alter plans. It may not have been, my point is, it may not have been God's original plan for everything to, to play out the way that it did for Abram's life because we have free will. God has plans, that I believe, that, that change. Now, we know it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around this because we're stuck in a time-based system. God knows everything. God knows the decisions you're going to make, but He doesn't make you make So God could have a plan for your life, and because of your decision, that plan has to change. For example, you know, um, maybe God wants a particular uh, man to become a, a, a pastor of a church. That that's the plan that he has set out for this person. And he wants, I want you to fulfill this role. But then that person, you know, screws it up by, by be making himself unqualified to become a pastor. Well, if that's the case, now God's got to make another plan for your life. Because you can't do that anymore, so there's going to have to be something else. But one of the good things that we do see out, out of this is that even though Abraham made a mistake, even though he did wrong, we can't know for sure what would have happened. We can't say it would have been, uh, you know, it, it probably it would have been different for sure, but it probably would have been better. God probably would have blessed him earlier on. He probably would have enjoyed more blessings in his life than he did by disobeying for all of those years, however many years that was, before he finally listened unto God. But what one important thing we can learn out of this is that God still used Abraham, even though he didn't listen to him right away. Okay, so if you're in a situation that, that maybe you weren't listening to God's call on your life, you weren't, you know, listening about, you're kind of doing your own thing, 
don't get so discouraged or down that you think, well, God can't do anything with me now. Because He can. And He did with Abraham. He did with me. You know, it's important not to give up on people. You see people, maybe, you know, we've had people come in this church and, you know, it's get excited and they think they're going to start growing and then they get out of church and they start doing everything else. But, I mean, they got saved. Don't give up on them. Continue to pray for them. It may just be, you know, that they're, they're going through a time kind of like Abraham did where they know what the right thing is to do. They know what they're supposed to be doing and they're not doing it. But it doesn't mean that they're completely out of the game and that God can never use them now because they disobeyed, because they didn't act fast enough. Like I said, this, this happened with me. I got saved at 20. Well, I was 20 years old. That's when I got saved. But I didn't really get founded in a good church. I didn't really change that much of my life. I didn't really, you know, I, I continued to, to live in sin the way that I was living before. I didn't even get baptized until about seven years after I got saved. There's a long time of, of not even getting baptized yet. And I knew I should get baptized. And when I finally started going to, uh, to Faithful Word, you know, I already knew. I didn't even have to have anyone ask me to get baptized. I was just like, yeah, you know, I, I know I need to get baptized. And of course, Pastor Anderson was like, well, let's just do it, you know, and... and I did end up getting baptized there, of course, and that was a big changing event in my life. But for all of those years, from the time I got saved until the time I got plugged into church and doing stuff, I wasn't listening to God's command. I wasn't listening to God's call in my life and in my heart to, to obey Him and to do what's right and to read the Bible and to go to church and to, you know, and to do all the things that a Christian ought to be doing. I knew enough. Now, I, I didn't know a lot, but I knew enough of what I should be doing. I knew I should be going to church. I knew I shouldn't be drinking. I knew that was wrong. It doesn't take a rocket scientist for, for a lot of these things that are sins in our life. Now, um, some of us honestly don't know and, and haven't heard these things because they never heard parts of the Bible and just are completely ignorant of it. I get that. But there's a lot of things at the end of the day. I mean, no one can sit here and tell me, well, I didn't know that it was wrong to murder somebody. Right? I mean, there's at some point, there's a level where you just know things are wrong. Okay, and, and um, when you get saved, you ought, to be, you ought to be trying to do what's right, and you ought to be listening to God's call in your life. But praise God, He has long-suffering, and He has mercy, and He's still willing to work with us after we make mistakes, even though sometimes we don't listen to Him right away. The, the point I want to make is that if, even if it's been a long time and you know you should have done something a long time ago, maybe you should have been baptized a long time ago, maybe, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of things, right? You can still get it right now. You can always use today, say, you know what, I'm going to get on the right track today. I'm going to make things right now. I mean, there's people out there that probably have, have girlfriends that say, oh, well, I've, I've already had children with my girlfriend. We live together. And it's like, we were going to get married and then it never happened. It's like, well, just do it now. Just get right now. Do the thing that you're supposed to be doing now. Don't give up on yourself and don't say, ah, oh, well, forget it. Forget it. I, I screwed up and now I can't serve God. That's wrong. If you're saved, you could always serve God. You never can screw it up so bad where you just can't serve God. And if you do, then you're not even going to be alive on this earth because if you're still alive, if you still have breath, if, you still have the, if God's allowing you to continue to breathe the air, then God's got a plan for you in this life. And... Um, you know, what I'm saying is don't let yourself get discouraged and also don't count other people out so quickly. You don't know what's going on they might, and, and, and we should always be praying and not giving up on people that they still might come back someday. The people that have, have left this church, I still think about them from time to time and I still pray for them from time to time. Now, if you're not here all the time, you're not going to be in my thoughts as much. And it's, that's just the way it is. I mean, I'm going to be praying for our members, the people who are here all the time, all the time. Because you're here, you're, 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 you know, you're going to be in my thoughts a lot more. But I still don't want to completely give up on, on the other people. People who have decided, eh, you know, they're making bad choices in their life. And um, we ought not to just be giving up on these people. Because God doesn't give up on them. God didn't give up on Abraham. He could have. For however long he, he dwelt in Haran with his father and, and didn't quite obey his commandments, God would have been very righteous in, in just giving up on him. But he didn't, because he's long-suffering, because he's merciful. 
And if you've spent quite a bit of time away from God's will, just know that He can and still will use you. And, you know, sometimes the plans have to change based on your circumstances, but He can still use you for His glory. Now let's look, jump back. I, I kind of skipped over verse number 3 because this is a really, a really big verse. We're going to spend some time on verse number 3 here of Genesis chapter 12. Verse number 3 reads... This is, so we'll go back to verse number two because God's giving, Abraham, when he tells Abram to go out his land, he's telling him the blessings that he's going to receive, right? He's saying, look, I'm going to bless you, Abram. Verse number two, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's a great blessing for Abraham to, to receive from God. He's saying, look, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to, you know, all the families of the entire earth, everyone in the world is going to be blessed through you, Abraham. That's a great blessing. And he says, and, and this is why I don't get people like to come. This is probably one of the most abused verses in the entire Bible, just completely ripped out of context. But what does he say? He's, he's speaking specifically to Abraham. He called Abram out of the land of the Chaldees. He, let, he called him out of there. He didn't call anyone else but Abram. And he's blessing specifically Abram. And when he blesses Abram, he says, I will bless them that bless thee. That word thee is singular talking to one person he's talking to abram and he says i will bless them that bless you and i will curse them that curse you and we see this throughout abraham's life the people that come out against abraham people that aren't dealing well with them they get cursed but the people that do well to abraham the people that, that are with them hey they're going to be blessed and this, is, this exactly literally happens in Abraham's life because it was a promise made unto Abraham. Yet today, you have Christians that will, that will teach that we have to just support this nation of Israel that exists today as a result of the United Nations granting the power for them to become a state and, and for this, land, this, this state to be established. Not because they came back to God, not because they got right with the Lord and now they believe on Jesus and God's bringing them back into this land. No, that's not the reason at all. It's because the, the, the wicked, evil United Nations, which is the precursor to our one world government that's going to be established. I mean, United Nations bringing all the nations together to form a governing body for the entire world is satanic and that's where which pr what produced or spawned the modern day nation of Israel and people will say that that land that 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 state of Israel today is what the Bible is talking about when he says I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee how in the world do you get that out of here first of all this is talking to Abraham this is not even talking to Israel Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac as his children. Now, we know that Isaac was a child of promise, but how, how are you going to interpret this? Are you going to interpret this only through um, that one seed of Israel? Or what about everybody? All of Abraham's children, right? I mean, that's for one, but also if this, and, and see, here's the thing. I can't wait for Marching to Zion to come out because that's what that, this movie is going to deal with, this type of an attitude. And it really is a problem in Christianity today, in modern Christianity, this notion of having to support Israel. I'll tell you why. Because these Christians are so, they've been fed this line so much, they don't even think about why they believe what they believe. And this is the cause for the United States getting involved in all kinds of wars that we should have nothing to do with. When we get involved with Iraq and Iran and in Saudi Arabia and all these other places in the Middle East, that we literally have no business going in and bombing and destroying and, and, and doing all this stuff and wasting all this money. What do Christians say the reason for being there? Well, we got to support Israel. we got to stand with Israel. I mean, I see people waving the Israeli flags that aren't, that aren't Israeli. And there's people that have, we saw, I saw a sign, we were out sewing at a sewing marathon last year, and this guy had this, this sign on his house that said, we stand with you, Israel. Like, 
it's some, you know, these Christians are so brainwashed into thinking that we have to stand with this nation of Israel because God's going to bless us if we somehow stand with them and, and give them arms and support them in their efforts and all their wars and go to war and fight for them and help them. It's stupidity. And I'll tell you why, because it's a, it's a total ignorant understanding of the Bible. First of all, we can clearly see he's talking to Abraham. He doesn't say that I will bless them that bless thee and all of your descendants ever for all time ever to come. He's talking specifically to Abraham. And I could prove that this doesn't last just as soon as God said that to Abraham here in Genesis chapter 12, it's just forever. That no matter what, everybody for your seed, for all of your descendants, for all time, you better bless them. And you'll get blessed. And if you don't, then God's going to curse you. That is it's stupidity. That's all it is. And I'm sorry if that offends you. It's stupidity because you need to start thinking about the things that you're being taught or the things that you believe and see if they line up with the scripture. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 19. 2 Chronicles 19. I want you to see this. We're going to go to 2 Chronicles 19 and Jeremiah 14. Both of these places are Old Testament references, obviously. Right? Both of these places we're going to see references to Israel. So in, in the first place we're going to, 2 Chronicles 19, in context, with the, the, what this chapter is dealing with, what this section of Scripture is dealing with, is when King Jehoshaphat, which was the king of Judah. Okay, you remember Israel was divided into two, especially two nations, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel, right? The kingdom of Judah had a tendency to have a lot more godly kings and that was the lineage of David and you know and that whole kingly line was was from the kingdom of Judah. The kingdom of Israel had to happen to have a lot more wicked kings, but they were a lot bigger and they had like 10 of the tribes. Okay, we're in we're in the kingdom of Israel. And that they maintained the name Israel. And look at verse number 2 of 2 Chronicles 19. In context, this is when Jehoshaphat went and helped Ahab. Now Ahab was a wicked king of Israel. Jehoshaphat went and helped him militarily. Ahab went to Jehoshaphat and said, Hey, help us out. We're in this battle against these other people, and I need you to help me. And Jehoshaphat's like, Sure, you know, we're like brothers. We'll come and we'll just we'll help you fight and we'll get in this war and fight with you. This is the exact same scenario that the United States could be considered in with Israel today. When Israel's in all these fights with other people, hey, United States, I want you to help us. I want you to bomb these people. I want you to go to war with us against these, these other heathen lands. Look at what was said unto Jehoshaphat as a result of helping Israel militarily. Verse number two, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Does that sound like a blessing or a cursing? Wrath is upon King Jehoshaphat because he helped the ungodly. Who are the ungodly? Israel. When Israel was ungodly, he is not being blessed by helping them out militarily. He simply wasn't. Yet today, people will try to teach you, we need to go over there and send our troops and, and support Israel. They're fighting these heathen lands, these, these Muslims and stuff, but we need to help them eradicate them. Look, the nation of Israel today is a Christ-rejecting nation that is ungodly. They are ungodly sinners that need to get saved. They have not repented. They have not gone back to God with all of their heart. They did not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. God isn't blessing them and bringing them into that land. They're ungodly. And if you, if you help the ungodly, just as, as Jehoshaphat did in 2 Chronicles 19, there's wrath that's going to come upon you from before the Lord. God needs to judge His people or any people for that matter that's living wickedly and promoting filth, God's going to judge them. You don't want to be caught in the crosshairs when God's trying to judge someone. You're trying to help them. That's like you're fighting against God. And we ought not to be in that type of a situation. Turn to Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah chapter 14, because the other thing you'll hear is, well, we need to be praying for Jerusalem. We need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And, they'll get, and I'm not even going to go to the psalm that deals with that. I've dealt with that in another sermon um, 
on the same topic. But Christians today, it's so important because it leads us into war. People will support these wars just because they think they're doing the right thing as a Christian and that they're going to receive God's blessing. And they're going to support us going and killing a bunch of people in a land that's not our land, that has nothing to do with us, and having our own children get killed going over there and fighting in these battles that have nothing to do with us, that we should be completely staying out of. Look at um, Jeremiah chapter 14, verse number 10. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. This is, again, talking about Israel. You have to read it in context. Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. He's saying, look, they like to wander away from me. They've gotten away from serving me. They're wicked. They're ungodly. Don't pray for them. Don't pray for their good. I'm not going to hear their cry. I'm going to judge them. Don't you be praying for them. And this is, again, people say, oh, we've got to be praying for Israel and stand with Israel and send our military to help Israel. It's a bunch of baloney. This is Old Testament. If at any time you were going to say, well, if they bless them, they bless him and curse him and curse him, you would think it would at least have lasted through the Old Testament, right? At least. Obviously, it wasn't meant as something that was passed on to Abraham, to all of his children, to all of their children, to all of their children, just completely regardless of anything that they did. That's not the way God operates. It's not the way God has ever operated. Turn, if you would, to um, Galatians chapter 3. Because Galatians 3, there's plenty of places in the New Testament that explain this. Galatians 3 is extremely clear. If you ever have anyone... That, that wants to argue with this or, 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 or not even argue. If you ever want to show somebody why this is so foolish what, you know, with Genesis chapter 12, because that's, you start talking to someone that wants to support Israel, they always quote Genesis 12, 3, always. Well, we've got to bless them, the bless thee, and curse them, the curse thee. It's like they don't even know what they're saying at the time. They just think, well, that just means we have to bless Israel. And there's this nation that's called Israel today, and we just need to bless them because we want God's blessing on us. No. Galatians 3 clearly defines what that blessing was even about um, that God had given unto Abraham and to his seed after him. Galatians chapter 3. Let me get there myself. And we're just going to we're going to start reading. We're going to read this entire chapter. I'm going to go through it real quick, though. So we don't spend too much time on this. Just listen up. I'll point out a few key verses. Um, Galatians 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ have, hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now here's where we get, it ties in with Abraham. Verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So right there off the bat, we see a definition of being a child of Abraham. Remember when Jesus Christ said, you're not, you know, if you were a child of Abraham, you wouldn't go about and try to kill me. You're of your father, the devil. Even though they were physically descended from Abraham. They physically descended from me. He said, you're not, the you're not a child of Abraham. If you were, you would do the deeds of Abraham. But you go about to kill me. This did not Abraham do. Abraham didn't go about trying to kill Jesus or any of the prophets. 
He's talking about spiritually. That's why he says, if you're of faith, you are a child of Abraham. So if you're going to pass along the promises that were made to Abraham, it's going to be by that it applies to his children through faith, not his physical descended seed. But let's keep reading here. Verse number eight. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So when we saw that all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through Abraham, what, what did that mean? According to Galatians 3, it meant because the gospel was going to be preached unto everyone and that the heathen, everyone is going to be saved through faith. Everyone has the opportunity to get saved when they put their faith on Jesus Christ. That's why the, the, you know, the Ammonites and the Moabites and all of the other heathens, they were going to be blessed through Abraham as well. All the families of the earth because they could receive salvation through faith. And why, is it all, why does it go back to Abraham at all? And we're going to see this real soon because Christ came from the seed of Abraham eventually. That it came through that line, through that lineage. The Savior of the world came through Abraham and the whole world is blessed through Jesus Christ, which God's saying, well, the whole world's going to be blessed through you, Abraham. I chose him for it to be that line that Jesus was going to be born from. But let's keep reading here. Verse number um, 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed, this is important, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And you mean to tell me that that blessing means on the whole nation of Israel? When Galatians 3, 16 says that it was to his seed, not seeds as of many, his seed one, which was Christ. That's who the blessing came down upon. That's where this blessing even came for, is, re, is referring to, was his descendant of one man, of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Not the entire nation, not the whole group of people. Through Jesus Christ. Verse 17, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The promise was made. The promise given to Abraham, the promise of those blessings was given to Abraham, and until the seed should come the seed singular Jesus Christ to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator now a mediator is not a mediator of one but God is one is the law then against the promises of God God forbid for if there had been a law given which could have given uh, could have given life verily righteousness should have been by the law but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This entire chapter is dealing with these promises that we're reading in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham. And what are the two main focuses in Galatians 3? Christ and faith. 
That's it. This is, this is the New Testament shedding light on what all of those promises were about, on everything that the Old Testament was about. When, when, Jesus Christ, when, when Abraham received these blessings, it's not saying for, for all time, whenever the nation of Israel is, exists, if you bless them, then you're going to be blessed by God. Even if they're completely anti-Christ, just bless them, you'll be blessed of God. That's foolishness. It goes against all logic, reasoning, understanding, and the scripture. Don't buy, be deceived by this stuff. Let's keep reading in uh, Genesis chapter 12. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. It, it, it's, it's so clear. I mean, does anyone have a hard time understanding what Galatians 3 is about? Does, it, does anyone just be like, I don't know, I still think that we should just be blessing Israel for no reason. I still think that Genesis 12.3 is referring to the current nation of Israel today that we ought not to curse. How can you, how can you read both of these chapters when Galatians 3 explains Genesis 12 and never once mentions the nation of Israel? Not once. It mentions Christ because that's who the promises were given unto. Abraham and Christ. That's why it was such a big deal. That's why all the families of the earth are blessed. That's why it was such a great blessing is because it's the blessing of Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading here. That's only verse number three. And I think we already read verse four, so let's read verse number five. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. So now, Abram's father's dead. They finally get into the land of Canaan, you know, and, and Abram's 75 years old. So let's keep reading verse number six. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sechem, unto the plain of Mori. And the Canaanite was then in the land. So now, now he's, he's shown up into the Canaanite's land. Verse seven, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Verse number nine, and, Abraham, and Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. But they will save thee alive. alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. So, Abram gets up, he gets in the land of Canaan. There's, there, after he's there for a little while, there's a famine. And it gets really bad. There's no food. So he's saying, okay, I need to do something. We're going to go down to Egypt for a while until this famine passes, and then we'll come back. And um, as he gets down to Egypt, he's, he's fearful. He fears for his life. He's saying, okay, this is a heathen land. They're going to see my wife. She's real beautiful. And they're going to want her and since they're heathen land, they're not going to care. They're just going to kill me and just take my wife. And, and, you know, I don't want that to happen. So since he was afraid for his life, he's saying, okay, here's the deal. I don't want them to kill me because they want you and, and we're married and they're going to have to kill me in order to get you. So just say that you're my sister. And that way you'll be doing me a favor because then they won't kill me. And this is the way he explains it to... Um, to Sarah. Now, one thing I find that's kind of interesting, Abram was 75 when he left to go into the land of Canaan. Again, we don't know how long exactly he spent until the famine came and then he go down to Egypt. I mean, let's say, let's just say, I mean, maybe a couple years, whatever. Um, Sarah was 10 years younger than him. So she's like 65 years old, I mean, minimum. She's, she's definitely old. She's going to be older than that when they go into Egypt. She must have been pretty beautiful still for, for a senior 
a senior lady to, 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 for him to be still concerned about that, that he's going to die. And actually, we see that she is like, you know, the, the, the people of Egypt see that she's a beautiful woman and, and bring her unto Pharaoh. And um, this really doesn't mean much of anything. I just think that's kind of interesting that she was so, you know, so much older and she still was a, you know, was a real beautiful woman. Don't think that just because you're growing old that you can't still be really beautiful. Not that the outward appearance isn't that much important anyways, but don't think that just because you know, your hair starts to turn color or whatever that all of a sudden you're no longer beautiful. That's something that the world is going to tell you that you know, they have an image of what beautiful is. But um, that's not necessarily what beautiful is anyways. But I thought it was kind of interesting that she's so old and he's still kind of worried about this. But the, the, the more important thing we need to learn from this is that Abraham makes a really poor decision here. And it's based on fear. And we need to make sure that when we make decisions in our life that we're not making them just based on fear. Um, God has already promised to make it. I mean, we spent the last 20 minutes talking about the, these promises that God made unto Abraham. How he's going to make a great nation out of him. He, you know, his seed, the whole world's going to be blessed through his seed. And at this point, he hadn't even com you know, commit the sin of, of, um, with Hagar and, and Ishmael being born. He had no children at this point. Yet he's still fearful for his life. And again, it's easy with the hindsight to look back and say, oh yeah, well of course, Abraham should have believed God. And he should have. And that's true. He should have. Because God made the promise and we need to be, you know, the, the word of God is gospel truth. When God makes a promise, he stands by it. Abraham had no reason to be fearful Spiritually speaking, in his flesh, he got afraid. And he made a really stupid decision. But we need to be aware of this, be conscious of this, because now thankfully God was still looking out for him and didn't allow anything to happen. But what could have happened? When he said he's his sister, you know, look, at, look at what does happen. Um, verse number... 14 says, and it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. So they come in the land. He's like, yeah, she's my sister. Oh yeah, he's my brother. This beautiful woman now is available because this is just a brother and sister that came into the land to stay for a while. So the people see her and they're like, hey, you know, Pharaoh's going to like this lady. So he's like, okay, come into my house. And this is, I mean, Pharaoh's the, the, the king, the ruler of the kingdom, right? And um, at that point, it's kind of like, well, how do you say no to that? You know, the, the, the whole ruler of the land that you're in is, is telling you to, to, to come or you, you go, right? And it says, and he entreated Abram well for her sake. So he's, you know, he's, he's being nice to Abram and stuff. Oh yeah, you know, here he, he says, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And, um, you know, why not treat, treat the brother, the brother well? Because that's all he thinks. And, and, you know, for Pharaoh's offense, he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. I mean, it's a brother and a sister. Why not take her? He's, she's beautiful. But, um, but now you see the situation that Abram's in. I don't know about you. I mean, I, the choice between like someone killing me yet not allowing anything to happen to my wife and just saying, okay, well, I want to stay alive and I'm willing to like let my wife become another man's husband or something. Like, cause that he had to know that would have been a possibility. If they would have loved her so much to have killed him for her, you ha he had to have thought that this could easily happen that someone's going to try to marry her or someone's going to try to take her. And if it's that wicked of a country that would have killed him, why would he think that they would have any type of respect even necessarily for her wishes of her saying, no, no, I don't want to marry him. Just, no. If they're willing to kill her husband for, for her, you know, in, in his mind, then why wouldn't they just take her? Just someone sees her and say, yeah, I, I want her to be my wife and just take her. And, um, So I don't know. I mean, put in that situation, I don't think I'd want to <laughs> allow my, you know, just to be consciously aware that my wife is just going to go and be someone else's husband for a while. And all of that just because there's not a lot of food where we were. 
I'd be like, if that's the case, let's just go back and, and scrounge and try to do something to stay alive, but we're not going to be here where I'm afraid that someone's going to kill me for my wife, or my other option is just to let her go and marry someone else. But God was looking out for him still, even though he made this bad decision. The Bible says, And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister, so I might have taken her to me to wife? Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. So now he kicks him out. He's like, look, why are you trying to bring evil upon me from God? You know what? You, you, you didn't tell me she's your wife. I could have taken her. And then he knows he would have been in sin. He would have just been taking someone else's wife and he would have done it ignorantly. He's like, don't do that to me. And, um, and it says in verse 20, And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So now he can't even stay there because... He made this foolish decision. And this is the last point, obviously, we're going to um, look at tonight. But um, turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. Because Abraham makes this decision, it's all based on fear. And we know that God's already promised him this, but he, he really had no reason to think that he was going to be killed. If God's going to remain true to his promise, you know, he should have known that, that he doesn't have to lie and play these games to try to stay alive. Um, even when you're surrounded by the heathen and there's no one there to like support you. I mean, he was, he was away from his family. He had no one with them. It's just him and his wife and they've come into this foreign land. They're foreigners and you know, they're, they're really at their mercy. But even in a situation like that, we need to maintain that faith in God that we're doing the right thing and that we can walk uprightly. Luke chapter 12, look at verse number 4. Jesus Christ speaking, he said, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. He's saying the worst that someone can do to you ultimately is, is kill your flesh. They can't kill your soul because if you have everlasting life, you're, you have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. They can harm your flesh and your body. And that is the worst. That is, that is where their power stops. That's all they can do. He says in verse number five, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath, hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings and not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not therefore. You have more value than many sparrows. He's saying, look, you need to fear God. God has a lot more that he can do unto you than, than any man can do. So if it's a choice that comes down between fearing God and keeping his commandments or fearing man and disobeying God's commandments, you better be fearing God. Even if, you know, the worst they can do is, is take your, your, your fleshly life away from you. You can take this body away from you. And that's about it. God can do a lot more than that. But then he, then he goes on to explain. He says, look, Five sparrows. So five little birds are sold for two farthings. And he says, and not one of them is forgotten before God. God pays attention even to the smallest birds. The little birds. God, pays, God knows about all of them. He makes sure they're fed. He makes sure that they, they have what they need. All the animals in the, in the world, God's, God's able to take care of them. He says, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God knows, like, I mean, each hair on your head is numbered. That's how much God cares for you and knows about you and, and, and is with you. But it requires the faith to know that because you don't physically see God standing beside you. These are things we have to recall to our remembrance when we are in those tough situations when we seem to be surrounded by the heathen or the enemy and all these, thi you know, all these things are going on, don't lose sight of, of how important you are to God, that all of your hairs are numbered. And he says, fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. I mean, you are way more valuable to God than these birds. God takes care of these birds, but you are way more valuable to them. And, and you know, we ought not to be basing our decisions based on fear. And it, 
we live in a world today, this is real important because we live in a world today where people are constantly trying to control you and manipulate you based on fear. We were just talking to a lady out soul winning today who said, you know, she was a, a little odd, but, but um, she was an older lady and like I think she was in her 70s or something, she said. But um, one of the problems she had with religion, she said she grew up Lutheran and there was just all this, she said it was just all this guilt and um, all this fear. And she said, I don't like all the fear. And, and, you know, and people just tell you, like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all fear-based. And I said, okay, well, you have to understand this. I said, listen, I have three little girls. And let's just say we happen to be up on the roof of a really high building. Wouldn't it be a good idea to tell my children that, that basically to make them afraid of getting too close to the edge of that building so that they don't fall off and die? And she agreed, oh, yeah, 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 that's good. of course, yeah, you should do that. You, do, you don't want them getting close. You know, they, they need to be afraid of that. So there's a healthy fear that you can have of that type of destruction, right? And, and it makes perfect sense. There's no reason not to fear um, something that's going to keep you safe in that regard. And this is what I was trying to explain to her. I said, well, the fear that we have that comes from God, because we ought to fear God, is for our benefit, for our protection, so to speak, keeping us away from falling off of that cliff, falling off of the edge of that building. That's the fear that, that we have um, that's, gonna, that's, that's for our protection. It's for our own good. And it's not used just to control people. You know, there have been churches throughout history that have used fear as a tactic to keep their congregation exactly where they want them. I mean, that's how the, the potter's house is today. And in, in Prescott, there's a church, it's a potter's house, and it's a charismatic church. And, and I'll tell you what, they are doing Satan's work more than any other church in this town. They are getting people to, I mean, they, they have their congregation under fear control. I talk to these people and they think like, yeah, you can't backslide, you can't do anything or else you're going to hell. Like you gotta just you gotta keep on doing right, you gotta live right, you gotta do all this stuff or else you're going straight to hell. And they literally control their congregation that way. And also there's some people then they completely sour and turn them away from God altogether because of that type of fear that they just use to control their people all the time. And um, and that's something similar to what this lady went through that we were talking about. But um, we see even outside of religion, there's a lot of people that are trying to use fear to manipulate and to control. It's even in the, you know, the government is, is really good at this, and I'll get into that in a second, but it's even in the truth movement. I mean, there's this fear mongering with, you know, um, the world's gonna end, and oh, this is the worst thing that ever happened, and we need to, you know, it's always this red alert, like nonstop, all the time. You need to be in fear, and you need to buy the survival food, and you need to buy this, and you need to buy that, and you need to buy this, and it's, and it's there is a goal to that, and, and part of it is making money off of the products that you sell. Now, are the products necessarily all bad? No, but just be aware of the fear. And don't be making all of your decisions based on fear. You can make wise decisions and plan for things, but don't be driven by a fearful attitude. Don't feel like you have to get rid of everything that you have in order to stock up on food and water for, for five years or something because the world's going to end. Don't, you know, I don't think you have to, to, to go with that. Now, if you want to prepare a little bit for it, fine. I'm all for the preparation, not a big deal. But, but what I'm saying is don't let this, this fear just, just drive you mad into making decisions that are going to be foolish ones, where you're just, that's your only focus or that's uh, where all of your resources are going to. But, um, you know, the government is also in the business of fear-mongering. Um, They've been using the, the fear of terrorism recently to perpetuate the, the military industrial complex and to continue to grab power and to reduce our freedoms. And when people get scared, they have a tendency to look for protection from their fears. It's a natural thing that we do as people. This, you get scared, you look for something or somebody to, to, to help protect you and help take care of you because you're scared and you want to feel better, right? And the problem is when the source of your protection is anything other than God. We need to be going to God for, for, as a source of our protection, as a source for our fears. Don't put the government in God's place, because that's what the government's trying to do. They're trying to make you scared. Oh man, you know, 
you go to the grocery store, you better be on the lookout for, for these terrorists that are looking to, to have their RPGs and like blow you up or something. I mean, this is, this is the type of, of nonsense that they, they, they want you to feel so afraid. And there's all these different risks and the cyber attack risks and all these other risks that, that these terrorists are going to come and they're just going to destroy America and we need to be really afraid and we need to give the government more power and they need to go over here and bomb some more countries so that we can feel safe and we can feel protected. We need to take on some individual responsibility. We need to get back to a mindset of where people say, you know what? I don't need the government to take care of me. I don't need anyone else to take care of me. I'm going to rely on God and I'm going to do what God told me to do and I'm going to walk with a good conscience and I know that if I'm doing what's right in God's eyes, God can protect me. God can protect me from those terrorists out that live in a cave somewhere plotting, planning against this America because they hate our freedoms, which is a, a line of garbage that's being fed from the, from the government, you know, instead of saying, oh, well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that we're destroying their homeland and, and a lot of innocent people and women and children and all kinds of people are dying over there, which makes them resent America because we're dropping bombs over there. That, well, that probably has nothing to do with it, right? They just hate our freedoms. They don't want our women to vote. That's, that's the whole, that's why they're, they're trying to take out as many Americans as possible. That's the whole reason. No, that's a bunch of baloney. But um, the Bible says in Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle. That's talking about you know, a, a physical defense, that having horses, getting prepared, ready to fight. That's, that's military strength, right? But safety is of the Lord. Meaning, it, nothing wrong with being prepared and ready, and you know, ready to go into battle, ready to fight, having your defenses up. But at the end of the day, God has to, has to provide you protection. Because you can be the number one superpower in the whole world, and if God's not protecting you, he could easily make it so that a nobody comes in and just overthrows you and destroys you, and, and you, you think that you're so strong, and you're not. And God's done that with all of the other worldwide kingdoms that have been around it's in the history of this world. And um, they've all fallen and been destroyed. Now, the children of Israel lost a lot of their personal freedoms when they desired to have a king over them. You remember that they got scared they, they saw the nations around them. they said oh this is how the heathen do it they all have kings and their kings they go out and they fight for them so when there's a war when someone comes against them they've got this great strong mighty man of valor this king and he's going to go out and he's going to lead the army and he's going to keep me safe and that was their mindset that's what they wanted they had the government that god had given them through the judges and god's law without a ruler, so to speak, you know, without a king as a ruler who, who was going to come and tax them and, and you know, bring them into some more bondage. They gave up their freedom just to have a little bit of security, just to have a little bit of peace of mind. And it just backfires on you all the time because he said, okay, well, the cost is going to be more than you're going to want to pay because now your children are going to have to go off and serve the king. He's going to take these lands for himself. He's going you know, to tax you. He's going to amass this wealth. And it's never going to be good for you. And that's where the tyranny is going to come in because you have one man in power that, um, that ought not to be. So we don't need to get someone else to do our fighting for us either. You know, we don't need a king to go and, and, and do the dirty work for us. We need to take the responsibility on ourselves, and ultimately just don't fear because if God be for us, who can be against us? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to maintain our faith, that we would, um, no matter what your, your calling is for us, we'd listen to you. And when we hear that we would act on it, dear Lord, we wouldn't just um, put it off or wait, kind of like Abraham did, kind of like I did even earlier in my life, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to, to act on our faith and act on the things that you tell us to do in a timely manner and um, we thank you for not giving up on us help us to pray for others that that might be easy for us to give up on Lord help us not to and, and help us to keep them in our prayers and our thoughts and um, even in their lives to, to maybe follow up with every once in a while and see how they're doing and try to bring them back into the fold dear Lord and um, finally God help us not to be too fearful help us to only fear you and to, to have the strength and the comfort 
that comes through faith in your Son, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.